Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about different measures of center that we can use. All right, so remember what we're doing here. We're kind of working through this acronym SOCKS, all right? This acronym is what we need to remember when we're describing a distribution. We've talked about shape, we've talked about outliers, now we're to center. So how do we decide how to describe the center of a distribution? Well, what we'll see is it really depends on the distribution shape, and so does how we describe the spread. Right? So that's why we had to look at shape and outliers first. The shape and presence of outliers will tell us what's the best way to talk about center and spread. Okay, so what are some measures of center? Well, how should we think about center? Well, the center of our data should describe we're trying to describe the most typical value of a data set. Right? You could also think about it as the central tendency. So if there was one number that I could use to kind of describe this entire data set, what would it be? So there's two ways we can think about this. You can kind of think it as, well, where's, where's the balancing point of this distribution? or versus where's the halfway point of this distribution. Now maybe you're thinking, isn't the balancing point and the halfway point the same? Well, sometimes, but not always. All right, so we're gonna think first about this balancing point idea, okay? That is the measure of center that we call the mean, All right? So it's the point right there in the middle, the, and actually the technical term is the arithmetic mean, okay? Most people, kind of call it the average, right? And this, this idea of averages is very, very common, right? This seems to be the first thing, really, that most people are going to jump to when you're, you're trying to describe or utilize some sort of data or some sort of statistics, right? The first thing people jump to oftentimes is, well, what's the average, okay? And, and that's fine in a lot of cases, right? The average does make sense in a lot of cases, but there's, there's some where it might not. Right? And there's lots of other types of averages you may have heard of, right? The, um, the trimmed mean, a weighted average, stuff like that. Right? But we're thinking about the pure arithmetic mean here. Okay, so we know when we're working with data, we have population parameters and sample statistics. Our population mean is calculated like this, and it's denoted by this lowercase Greek letter here, mu. So if you're not familiar with this kind of mathematical notation, right, basically what this means is, we, we've seen this before, big capital N, right? that's our population size. Okay, so what this means, we, we know the idea of an average. right? Take all your observations, add them up, divide by how many you have. All right, so this says, this is summation notation. Right? This says from observation 1 or x1 all the way through observation n, xn. Add all those up, divide by n. That gives me my population mean. And this is a parameter right? because it's a number that describes the population. Okay, our sample mean on the other hand. Formula looks very, very similar except we've got little n, right? Remember, lowercase n is our sample size. So this is a statistic where we're looking at, so this is a statistic, right, which we're calculating from data. All right, so notice the, the subtle differences here. Right now, for one thing, parameters are typically denoted with Greek letters, right, mu here. Okay, and statistics are usually just regular, regular Roman letters. Right. So, we're not going to go into too much depth about depth how to calculate these things. I just wanted to show some notation there. Right. Mu is our population mean. X bar is our sample mean. Okay, so how do we apply these things? Right. Well, let's think about the mean of a symmetric distribution and how it describes the central tendency. So here's a dot plot of ACT scores for a bunch of students. Right in the little triangle, 
represents the mean of this distribution. Okay, so does this little triangle, does that represent kind of your average student, your typical student? Yeah, I think so. So it looks like since this distribution is symmetric, the mean, the balancing point, is a pretty good representation of typical value. What about in a skewed distribution? All right, so here are the, the salaries of baseball players from a few years back. And it's actually an extremely skewed distribution. Okay, so we got a bunch of players over here who make a ton of money, but the majority of our players are, are over here and actually making less than a million dollars. Okay, so the mean is again represented by this little triangle. Right, but is that triangle a very good representation of your typical baseball player? That triangle's here at about three, a little above three million? Well, I don't think so, because it looks like to us, our typical baseball player is making under a million dollars. Right? And again, this is back in 2010. Now their salaries are even more out of control. But so what's happening here? Well, it looks like all of these players that are making a bunch of money are kind of throwing things off. All right? So what we're seeing here is the mean can be sensitive to extreme observations. And the effect that it's having, the effect that that skewness seemed to have, the way we might describe it is we're pulling it towards the skewness. The mean is pulled towards outliers, extreme values, or skewness. Another point here that we want to make is that this effect does tend to be stronger the smaller the sample. Right? For example, if you've got a, a basketball player who's he's averaging 20 points per game and you're well into the season, you're you know 30 games into the season, and he has a bad night, he scores 10 points, right? It's not really going to bring his average down that much. Right? But what if it's your you know your third game of the season? You're averaging 20 points and then you score 10 in that third game. Right? That's going to bring your average down a lot more. Okay, so outliers, maybe not as big of a deal if we have a huge sample, but definitely have an effect if our sample is small. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the mean might not be appropriate lots of times when we see skewness. All right, so if the mean isn't appropriate, what is appropriate? What do we mean by what's the best measure of center? All right, the mean is good when it's symmetric. There are two ways we can think about it, the balancing point or the mean. We can also think about the center as the halfway point or the median. All right? We've seen the median a little bit before in the context of measures of location. Right? But here we're talking about the median as a measure of center. The median might be a better representation of center if we have skewness. Okay, so why is that? Well, the median is more robust than the mean, right? Robust is just a fancy statistics word that means it's not as affected by violations of assumptions, right? In this context, the median isn't going to be affected by outliers, right? Because the median is counting based. So whether I'm counting some number that's an outlier or not, and I'm just counting towards the middle, the median is not affected by that, right? And if I change just one little thing here or there, it doesn't really change the median. So what do we mean by this? Let's try to demonstrate it. Well, what if you had this simple little data set, 1, 2, and 3? Well, the median of this data set is 2, obviously. The mean of this data set is also 2. Right? So super simple. But let's change it up just one number. Right? 1, 2, and 3,000. So what happens to the median? Well, it's just the same. But the mean changes significantly. This is maybe a little bit oversimplified, right? but hopefully you get the idea here. Okay, so one little change or one little outlier doesn't affect the median, but has a big effect on the mean. The median is more robust and more appropriate for a lot of skewed situations. All right, let's think a little bit more about this relationship between the mean and the median here. Okay. 
So I think I already mentioned, well, maybe you were thinking, wait a minute, isn't the balancing point and the halfway point the same thing? Well, yes, in a lot of cases it is. If our distribution is symmetric, balancing point, the mean and the median, should be about the same. In fact, if our distribution is perfectly symmetric, the mean and the median should be exactly the same. Okay, but we know already the effect that skewness has on the mean. It pulls it in that direction. Well, let's examine this idea visually. All right, so a symmetric distribution, we know the mean and the median should be close. But if our mean is pulled in the direction of the skewness, that means if I have a left skewed distribution, the mean should be pulled to the left, therefore the mean will be less than the median. On the other hand, if I have a right skewed distribution, the mean will be pulled towards the right, so I should have a right skewed distribution. Okay, so in words, maybe that's a little bit confusing, but let's, let's see this visual. Right? We see for a perfectly symmetric distribution, the mean is equal to the median, and we're actually bringing the mode in here too. Right, remember modality. Right, left skewed, the mean is pulled in the direction of the skewness, so the mean is going to be less than the median. Right? For a right skewed distribution, my mean is pulled to the right, so my mean is going to be greater than my median. So the mean and the median are the, probably your most important and most common measures of center. All right, but there's some other things that we can talk about here. We mentioned our mode a little bit, and we've mentioned it before. The mode kind of has some association with central tendency or typical value. Right? But for continuous data, the mode itself is not extremely useful, the actual value. right? Because depending on the precision of the data and how it was calculated, right, you may not even have a mode. Right, we think of the mode at more along the lines of modality. Right, where do I kind of see humps in my histogram? Right, so that's what we're more interested in mode-wise. But it is a number sometimes that you might work with. Another number that you see from time to time is the mid-range. Um, it's just calculated by our min plus our max divided by 2. I mean, it's not extremely useful, but you might see it somewhere. So we know what that is now. All right, the other thing we want to talk about here associated with the mean is well, what if we don't have the actual data? What if we have the data summed up in a frequency table and we want to find its mean? Well, if we don't have the raw data and it's summed up in a table, we can't find the exact mean, but we can get a pretty good estimate of it. Right? We can say, all right, if I have observations here in a certain class, right, but I don't know exactly what the observations are, well, let's just use the class midpoint right, as a representation of that data point. So the idea is I take the class midpoint, and in this formula, your, your class midpoint, we'll call it x, multiply it by the frequencies, then divide by the sum of the frequencies. The sum of the frequencies, you could also just call this n. All right, so that's the idea. This is a pretty good formula for doing it. An alternative way you can do it right, is you can, if you have the relative frequency of each class, just multiply the class midpoint by the relative frequency, then sum those up. All right, so we'll see some examples of this, applying these ideas in the future. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.